mean, the, the stock the stock market is in the middle of of the biggest stock bubble in the history of this country. I mean, all the all the stock markets around the world have been in a bubble, and they, they, it's a function of all the money that's been printed and all the credit that's been created. Thanks for watching this RTD interview. Don't forget to pick up your RTD Scary George Round, only available at sdbullion.com. Now enjoy this interview. Thanks for tuning in to this Rethinking a Dollar interview. Today I'm excited to have returning guest, David Kranzler, the author and creator of Investment Research Dynamics. Today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the global economy, as well as a variety of other subject matter. So Dave Kranzler, welcome back to Rethinking a Dollar. Thanks for having me back, Mike. I love being on here. Well, I appreciate you taking time to uh, sit down with us. Uh, I want to basically start off and find out what, what's, what's on your mind these days. What are you looking at? What, what concerns you? A lot of things is happening. We had last week Jerome Powell, Marcus Today. What, what's, what's, what does Dave Kranz keep an eye on? We have everything to be worried about. Um, you know, not, not the least of which is the massive increase in, in the amount of debt just globally, but specifically in the United States at, at every level of our economic system. And I, what really concerns me is I think the general population isn't, isn't really aware of that. I don't, you know, I don't, I think they either don't really care to follow the, the, you know, economic and political news on a day to day basis, or they basically consume the, the stuff that's promoted in the mainstream media. Like, you know, I, I'd love to see a poll that shows how many people out there actually believe that the true unemployment rate is 3.8%. I mean, I bet you it's a majority, you know, more than 50% would, would say, oh, yeah, well, that's because that's what the Fed tells us. I, I think just kind of a, a general, I, I think, especially if you look at like the sentiment numbers, the sentiment numbers have been coming down a lot. Um, you know, the hope component of it and the, and the out, future outlook and the outlook for wages, those have been falling sharply lately. And I, and I, think, I think the general public knows that, that things aren't right and that, you know, that things aren't as good as we're being led to believe or as good as <clears throat> you might think if you, you know, look at what the stock market's done since Christmas um, so I, I do think the public senses things are getting worse, but I think just the general awareness of, of how bad it is, if you really lift up the hood on the system and look at, look at the inner workings of what's really going on. And, and so, I mean, I know that's kind of general, but, um, you know, it's kind of a, a long winded way of saying, I mean, everything worries me right now, you know, from, from the bad economy to, to the, the, um, political bipolarization that's gone on in this country to, you know, obviously the social unrest that's starting to, uh, it seems like starting to escalate. And I, I think it, I think all of that sort of just reflects how rotted the system is underneath the surface. So, um, and I, I do think that between say now and the end of the year, between now and this time next year, I, I do think that there's going to be, I don't want to say a, a collapse, but I think I think the system's going to be in a lot worse off than it is right now. I think unemployment, the real unemployment rate, is going to be a lot higher. Um, and I, I think I don't think the public's mentally braced for that. Right. So I do now you start off, you know, and within the explanation there, you gave about three or four things that I took away, and I want to start on the very first one. And it has to do with the debt. And so last week, debt ceiling removed, suspended, whatever they want to call it. It's amazing that whenever the bills are due, the ceilings raised, or now for two years, there's no limit for the most part to what can be done or what can be created. And so that plays into, you know, the, I guess the need to prop this thing up continuously. And most Americans don't really take account uh, how dangerous this is. Shine a little light on what this debt ceiling removal for two years means. What do you see? How much will be brought into existence outside of the deficits we know about and give us, you know, some scenarios of how this might play out in the next couple of years. You know, that, that's the idea of a debt ceiling. That's a, that's a beautiful propaganda tool. That's a perfect example of, of one of the primary falsehoods that gets floated out there. Like, uh, you know, Oh, well, you know, the government's limited on the amount it can spend by the debt ceiling. 
well, the debt ceiling's non-existent. You know, as you say, ultimately when the bills come due, the debt ceiling gets raised and now it's suspended for two years. Uh, whatever that means, it basically means the government can spend and borrow as much as it wants. I, you know, but you're looking at, um, you know, I remember a year ago, the CBO and the mainstream was, was projecting, you know, I don't know, an $800 million spending deficit for deficit for the uh, 2019 fiscal year. And, and that was what was promoted in the media. And, and, and it, you know, it's higher than it had been. Honestly, if you look at the, the spending for the first six months of the government's fiscal year, the fiscal year runs from October to the end of September. It was, I think it was something like $780 billion of deficit spending. Okay, so that you're looking at a run rate of over a trillion and a half of deficit spending, which is, has to be funded by new debt issuance. So of course they were going to have to raise the the seat or, or suspend the debt ceiling. I mean, I don't think they know how much they're the, how big the deficit's going to be this year. I mean, because when you look at that, most of the cash flow or the majority of the cash flow, or greater than fifty percent of the cash flow is going to flow in in the first half of the fiscal year because that's that captures your tax season. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I, the way that I look at at uh, at debt issuance. And I think it's the right way to look at it, and no one can refute me on this, is that debt issuance, especially government debt issuance, is no different than money printing. Because when you issue, when, when, you, when you take out a loan, you're given spending power, and that spending power spends exactly the way printed currency would spend. And, and that spending power isn't pulled back until, until you have to pay back that debt. You see what I'm saying? So people have to pay back credit card debt or, you know, face bankruptcy or whatever, um, where you get a lot of pain in the ass calls from credit collectors. But um, there are no credit collectors for the U.S. government. So when they're issuing debt at an increasing, in an increasing amount, and it never decreases, when they're increasing debt in perpetuity, that's no different from printing that money because it spends just the same. You know, now the... the, the <laughs> The apologists will will argue that yeah, but the debt has to be paid back. Well, yeah, but it never is, and so that's that's the same thing as printed money, and it it it's um, you know the gradual devaluation in, of the spending power of the dollar, and that's what we've seen since 1971. So uh, essentially, removing or suspending the the debt ceiling for two years is essentially giving Trump a, a printing press or the Trump government a printing press. Yeah. I do agree. Now, you know, one of the, the second point you hinted on was unemployment and people coming to realization of what the real figures might be, because I, I believe eventually it's going to be hard to continue to believe the statistics that are given to us by the, own, the, the, the government agencies, the agencies themselves. But yet I, I read an article recently about, uh, I think it was from Alice from some bank mentioning that the new round of tariffs might uh, impact employment in reference to retail sales and approximately 7,500 or more store closures uh, I guess it's fall or some time frame. And so there will be a realization that jobs are being lost. So with this tariff situation, um, this new 10% issue last week uh, on, on additional tariffs, you know, will we have some impact between now and Christmas, you think? And will that hinder the, the Christmas spirit, in, in your opinion? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't speak toward the Christmas spirit per se. Uh, you know, I, I do think it's, it's probably not going to be as pleasant a Christmas for a lot of people, a lot more people than it wasn't pleasant last, last year. Um, you know, and again, it depends on how lenient the credit card companies are going to be with, with giving people rope to hang themselves. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the tariffs are essentially a tax. And the way I look at it is it's essentially Trump shooting himself in the foot because the, the tariffs affect his constituent base as much as anyone. And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's people are going to have, it, it's, it's going to take up even more of people's um, disposable income. <clears throat> and, and it's, it's going to lead to more retail store layoffs. I mean, the retail, the, the, the brick and mortar retail store situations affected both by just the general economic decline 
you know, which the tariffs are going to hasten. I, I, you know, we were going to going into a decline with or without the trade war. And I still believe to this day that one of the primary motives for starting the trade war was to use it as a cover story for the deteriorating economy. Because this way, you know, politicians always need a scapegoat. Policy leaders need a scapegoat. So now they can point at China and say, well, China wouldn't agree to, to settle the trade war. And that's why we're in a bad economy. So, um, yeah, I think it's I think between now and the end of the year, things are going to get worse. There's obviously going to be a lot more retail store layoffs. And then, you know, the other troubling trend uh, and it's right out of Brave New World is is you got companies like Walmart are replacing employees with robots or even just um, self checkout lanes. I mean, when I go to the grocery store, you know, because I don't have to shop for a big family, but. Um, you know, if I have a small basket of stuff at the grocery store, I go right through the self uh, self checkout area, you know, and so that that right there has has just reduced the amount of employees these grocery stores need to hire. And now I guess Walmart's um, hiring robots to to replace a lot of the workers. And that's, that's another general trend that's going to infect, affect the overall level of employment. Yeah, I do agree. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people uh, don't, don't see it coming right before their very eyes. Now, I want to get your thoughts on last week, uh, FOMC meeting, uh, up until that, I guess, 2.30 announcement or the, 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 the speech that was given and, and the Q&A afterwards. Um, it, it seemed a little bit different than prior years because people were asking, actually asking questions that seemed like they were, had a little bit of emotion behind it. Not sure, did you get a chance to watch it? And what are your thoughts on the quarter, uh, quarter uh, drop? Is that you know, is that something, is that one of many to come this year, you think? You know, that's interesting. Um, one thing that irritated me <laughs> that Powell said, and I, I didn't watch, I don't watch the press conference. It's, it's a zoo. It's a three ring circus. Um, I, I don't pay a lot of attention to the whole event other than, you know, I want to see what their policy decision was. And then, you know, I read the bullet points, the main, you know, the main points to policy if there's policy changes, the main, you know, I want the main takeaway from that. And so it was the quarter point rate cut. And then um, the fact that they're going to stop shrinking their balance sheet two months early, which I thought was the more significant part of the policy decision. Um, you know, Powell said, well, this isn't, this isn't a, um, the start of a, of a, another interest rate, you know, a lowering, a lowering cycle, whatever he calls it, you know, a rate reduction cycle, you know, those tend to happen over long periods of time. And in one sense, that's correct. But in another sense, it's completely wrong because, you know, I ran some numbers that I put in my short sellers journal and it, it took them, it took them about 17 months to take the Fed funds rate from, from five and a quarter down to essentially zero. And so that happened in 17 months. It took them um, seven years before they started raising rates again. And now they're back to cutting, cutting them again. However, if you look at the big picture, you go back to 1981, we've been in a, we've been in a rate reduction cycle since, you know, since 1981, you know, when, when uh, after Volcker yanked up the, the Fed funds rate, I guess to 18%, I think it was something like that. And, um, and then immediately afterwards, they started lowering them. So, and it, it's just been a general cycle of the Fed funds being lowered over time. So, um, yeah, I mean, to that extent, we've been in a, what's that, a, a 38 year rate reduction cycle. Yeah. So, but I think he's talking about more in the, in the median sense where they raise rates for a while. Well, they didn't really raise rates. Um, you know, it, it took them forever just to get up to two and a half percent. Now they're cutting them already. You know, and originally, the original thinking behind QE was that they would um, print money, throw it into the system, system stabilizes, and then they would remove that money. The whole system was set up to remove it. And they've only removed about a quarter of it, not even less than 25 percent of it. And they have to stop removing it. So that just tells you fundamentally and structurally how bad the economy really is especially they can't even it was literally in january when they announced that they were going to stop shrinking the balance sheet at the end of october and here we are what seven months later six months later and they have to stop shrinking the balance sheet two months early 
I mean, we've, the, 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 in the SOMA account, which is, was basically the money printing account where they printed money and bought treasuries and mortgages, there's still something like $3.6 trillion worth of, of securities in there that are going to stay in there. Ad infinitum, it appears now. Yeah. And but, ultimately, I think that, you know, when you stop shrinking the balance sheet and you run out of room to take rates from two and a half percent down to zero, um, you know, they're going to have to start printing money again. I mean, they're going to have to figure out a way to, to fund all of the, the new treasury issuance that's coming because yeah. I don't think foreigners are going to keep funding it. Right. I agree. So they stopped tightening. And so they're going to be easing. And so do you think they're going to ease at a, at a somewhat at that, at that former, was it 50 billion a month they bought, you know, uh, securities or whatnot. So do you think them starting that again or doing something a lot more in your opinion? I don't know. I, you know, I, I mean, I just, this is, I kind of watch the fed like this, you know, it's like watching a, a, a train wreck in slow motion and there's nothing you can do about it. And they're going to come up with some sort of, I mean, the idea of quantitative easing was a creative propaganda term for what is this, what was essentially money printing. You know, the fed created money, threw it in the system and most of it's still in the system. So, you know, and, and MMT, maybe they'll, maybe they'll adopt MMT, which is really essentially de facto money printing. So um, I have no idea what the next round of money printing is going to look like. I'm not sure they can take interest rates or the Fed funds rate negative. Um, but, you know, they're definitely going back down to zero at some point. Yeah. Now, I, I was looking at uh, just, just trying to do some calculations myself. And I think I calculated approximately nine uh, quarter point uh, drops that I guess they could do incrementally over time if, if, if they choose to do such before we get to zero. Now, the question is, will they stick to that quarter or will they have to go some, you know, a little bit a lot more drastic? Like I know President Trump, you know, wants a full uh, 100 basis points. But, you know, it, it, I, it's, no, it's no question how it's going to pan out, but it's going to be ugly. And so in the, in the future, along with that, gold prices last week spiked as well. So it looks like the same time frame that uh, the FOMC gave out their statement, the price of gold globally went up in a variety of currencies. Uh, is this an ongoing trend, do you think, because of all this uncertainty, because of monetary policy? I, well, I mean, I think, I think uh, the, the Fed's monetary policy is certainly in the mix of ingredients, but I think there's, there's a lot of variables that are influencing the price of gold, the trade war, the escalation of, of uh, geopolitical tension, um, just general, I mean, you know, a lot of other central banks around the world have never really stopped printing money. So, um, um, there, and, and actually in most currencies around the world, gold is at all time highs. So, and, and that's, that's because of the money printing policies and, and everything else going on. So, um, it, it really in, in priced in terms of dollars, the U.S. dollar price of gold is just now starting to catch up, and I think it's going to catch up pretty quickly. Like certainly a lot more quickly than I would have expected. But you know, the Fed backpedaling on its its original promise to remove money and and normalize interest rates. I mean, that was the other thing over the last couple of years. They keep redefining what the term normalization means. You know, and. And that's what, again, circling back to what we talked about at the beginning, that's what concerns me about the general public is, I mean, they don't, people don't have time to, to take the time to understand what all of this means. So I think as a default, they just kind of, you know, oh, the, well, the Fed's an expert on this, so I'm just going to have to put faith in what he says. So if he tells me that normalized interest rates used to be 5 or 6% and now they're 2%, then that's what I'm going to have to accept. So. Um, I mean, there, there is really no definition for normalization and, and certainly human beings can't replace what sh should be allowed to be priced by the market as opposed to humans. And, and we've had a, a long period of time now where human beings have been putting a price on money and that's what's caused our problems. That's the very root of our problems right. is, is, is leaving monetary and economic policy in the hands of humans instead of letting the market determine what it should be. 
Right. Now, I want to get your thoughts on, uh, as a response, it looks like to the tariffs. I got, I'm, I'm hearing and reading that uh, China decided to allow the yuan to return to, I guess, uh, what's considered relatively low figures that hasn't been seen since 2008. Uh, the yuan is about 7 to 1, the exchange rate. And so do you think this is a deliberate response to the tariffs or is this a part of a different plan on the, on the Chinese part or what? What are you, what are you reading into this? <laughs> Depends on who you believe. If you, if you believe Trump, he's saying the Chinese are manipulating their currency and driving it lower. If you believe the Chinese, they're, they're saying, no, it's, you know, we're not, we're not driving it, our currency lower in response to, you know, Trump's imposition of tariffs or Trump escalating the trade war. Um, I mean, here's the problem that there's price discovery. The central banks have essentially removed price discovery from all the markets. And so, I mean, everything is just artificially priced. I mean, how do you, how do you put a, um, a, a valuation multiple of, I don't know, what is it like? 150 times revenues for beyond.com. <laughs> I mean, it's got 80, 80 million in, in trailing revenues or 90 million in trailing 12 month revenues. And it's got a, a multi-billion dollar market cap. You know, I mean, that just tells you there's complete absence of price discovery in all the markets. And that includes the price of money. I mean, the price of money is essentially determined by the cost to, you know, you lend me a dollar and then you, it, you know, uh, and you tell me how much you want in return for lending me that dollar, say, uh, I got to give you a dollar five back. That's, that's the cost of money. So when you have everyone in the whole system setting the price of money that way, that's the market setting the price of money, not, not human beings. And so, um, I mean, what's the natural exchange rate for the one versus the dollar? I don't know. No one can tell us that because it's been artificially determined for so long. It's just like the U.S. dollar. I mean, you know, the, the, the U.S. government labels China a currency manipulator. Well, we've had something called the Exchange Stabilization Fund that was established, I believe, in 1936, 1935, somewhere back then. And it was established for the purpose of stabilizing foreign currency exchange rates, keeping the dollar stable. You know, and that's essentially a fancy way of of, of saying the government will intervene in the currency markets when they think the dollar is getting too far out of whack relative to other currencies. So, um, again, the, the nexus of all the economic and fiscal problems that the world has is, is because, um, you know, the price of money has been determined unnaturally. So, uh, where I think this is headed, and it's, you know, it's going to be a rough road between here and there is eventually gold will be reinstated as an anchor for, for currency. How do you see that happening within the next, I mean, do you think that process being sped up because of everything that's going on or was that, was that going to be the natural evolution of, of, of currency anyway, to get back to something sound and stable to measure value in the form of gold? I mean, it's just one of those things where, where, where a trend happens gradually, it, you know, a trend that leads to a change happens gradually and then it happens all at once. And I think we're on the edge of something like that happening all at once. Now, how long it takes for that process to play off, play out is, is anyone's guess. I have no idea, but certainly, certainly what's going on around the world and what's going on domestically politically, socially, economically, financially, they're, they're, all, they're all signs that, you know, we're getting close to that all at once point. And, and that's, that's where you're going to get, you know, a big reset that, you know, everyone, everyone alludes to. And, you know, how ugly it's going to be or what it's going to look like, I have no idea. I mean, my biggest fear in that regard is that there's going to be some sort of major global military conflict that breaks out because that always seems to happen when you get to that all at once point. All right. Now, as we draw towards the end of our discussion, I want to get your thoughts on some recent news in reference to the whole stock market and the bond market as a response to all this trade stuff. So uh, it looks like the Dow's down, you know, close to six, 700 points uh, as of today, as we're speaking. And so is this the beginning of something that's going to, you know, continue on or will it spike back up tomorrow as if nothing ever happened or or what's happening in the stock and bond market right now? Is confidence really starting to 
be uh, questioned? You know, again, I mean, the, the stock the stock market is in the middle of of the biggest stock bubble in the history of this country. I mean, all the all the stock markets around the world have been in a bubble, and they, they, it's a function of all the money that's been printed and all the credit that's been created. So, um, you know, again, and I said this, I said this leading up to 2008 and the S and P I think was around 1500. And I said, you know, the S and P could get taken down to 300 and you know, at, it would be at that point where it would probably approach a fair valuation based on using historical PE ratios when markets bottom, but they didn't let the S and P get down that far. It got down to ironically 666 is where the S and P bottomed out. So it got pretty close to my target certainly a lot closer to my target than it was from where it topped out at 15, 1600, whatever the number was. Um, and, and so, you know, but like I said, they didn't let it reach a point of fair valuation. That's when they started printing money, right? They started printing money and the, and the S and P bottomed about, I don't know, three or four months after the money printing program started. So, you know, again, I think it, I think how low the market goes this time around is going to be a function of the degree to which printed money can be used to keep the system propped up. And, you know, don't make no mistake, you know, they're probably in there today, at least trying to slow down the rate of descent of the stock market. So, um, you know, and again, everything is so artificially everything ran up so artificially with, with all of the technology and, and, you know, that you read about the hedge fund algorithms, mm -hmm. the computer trading, et cetera, that it's like a coiled spring, you know, it's a coiled spring that someone's holding upside down and it, there's no telling how violently it could, it could go to the downside. Um, and there's no telling the degree to which attempts to, to cushion the downside are, are going to work. So, you know, but again, you know, and I, I make this point, and I, I really don't hear many other people ever talk about it, but it, you know, it's one of those things that it's a white elephant in the room that everyone ignores. I mean, the accounting standards have changed so vastly between now and, and 1999, so that if you were to apply gap accounting standards to the S&P 500 earnings, the, the earnings that the, the earnings per share for the S&P that you would arrive at using 1999 gap standard gap standards would, would probably be, I don't know, 30 or 40% lower than they are now. So it, again, if you were going to go through the exercise of calculating how those earnings would have been calculated in 1999 and then apply a bottom of the cycle PE ratio, which would get you down to about a five or six PE ratio which is about where um, markets have bottomed out historically, you know, you'd probably be looking at an S&P 500 that would be well below 1,000. And people probably think I'm crazy for saying that, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me to see, a, you know, eventually at least a 50% sell-off in the S&P, which would take it down to about 1,400, but I could easily see it going below 1,000. Hmm. And I, again, I don't want to put a time frame on that because right. it's not going to happen right away. People can imagine. Yeah, and that's one of the things where because we've reached a point of, of extreme radical monetary policy, I would never say what couldn't happen in real world terms in reference to the manipulation when it ends, how bad things could really get. So a thousand to me, I, I would I would say I'm not even I'm not even savvy as you when it comes to you know those type of figures there, but I would say it has to go probably a lot lower than that because of how inflated everything has become. So, um, right. yeah, that's just my little two cents. But Dave Kranzler, it's been great to have you here. If there's any last thoughts you want to leave us with, anything else, and definitely we'll look forward to connecting with you again and get your thoughts down the line and see where, where we're at at that point. But any last thoughts you want to leave us with? You're assuming people want to hear my thoughts, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> they do. We um, enjoy hearing it. You know, again, I, I, would, I would say um, to the extent that people have – money out there that they're looking to invest buy physical gold and silver and and keep it under your mattress don't leave it in a bank safe deposit box don't leave it in a depository somewhere um you know i i think we're entering one of those periods of time when you need to be concerned about the return of your money not the return on your money 
And if you're heavily invested in the stock market, you're going to, you're going to learn how negative the returns on your money can get if you leave your money in the stock market and the fixed income CDs, what those are worthless. Those, those are paying a lower interest rate than, than the real inflation rate. So, um, I was running some numbers earlier. Um, since gold bottomed out at 1,050 in December 2015, gold's up 44%, 44.6% since then. It's up 14.6% since mid-November 2018. So, um, you know, for for an investment or an asset that's supposed to function as wealth preservation, those are pretty damn nice gains on your money there. And, and I think we're going to continue to see returns on gold and silver like that going forward for a while. Dave, enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to connecting again in the future. Thanks, Mike. Look forward to talking with you again soon.